I don't know how to. Never mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> guys, to... we're live. Um, welcome back to another Thursday with uh, Michael Frankie and myself, Caroline Kane. Excited to have you guys on here. I saw that Colleen was uh, she was here early. She was here at eleven thirty, and she said, "I can't wait." So yeah. I'm glad you guys are in here. If you have not already, make sure. Just so you're aware, I'd actually just pull, I'll say this a few times during this live, but grab your phones, turn your alarms on for Thursday at 12 o'clock Arizona time. Uh, this little lunch break, we go live and we just want to make sure we're helping and serving and showing you guys how to get deals done. Um, and then we talk about situations that are actually happening. I know Michael came on to a Zoom I had yesterday and this is an opportunity for me. I'm still learning from Michael and I'm doing a lot and I don't know if Eddie's going to be on here. He's actually just on the last Zoom I had, but Michael, we brought up Eddie here two, three weeks ago who started practicing the strategy of basically your roadmap for success. And for everybody on here, Eddie had been trying to gain traction for two years. He'd been doing the work. He'd been contacting agents. He'd been contacting homeowners um, and just hadn't had a deal closed. Went after the strategy that we practice and got a deal under contract. And he's like, guys, in 28 days, I'm going to make twenty six or mm -hmm. yeah, $26,000. And we spoke with him yesterday morning and came and corrected it. Cause he's like, I thought I was going to lose this deal. I'm like, Oh no, there was a lien. He got wiped out and now he's making $60,000 on the deal. So that's nuts. Maybe. We've had Eddie has 60 Kaylee and Monica that copied off of this had $70,000 on our first deal. So for everybody in here, I just want you to understand this is direct to motivation. And this is why I'm always like, you need to know Michael Frankie, you need to get on these opportunities and ask questions. So the whole point of this every Thursday, we do this for free. We don't make any money from this. We're taking time away from our business. I know Michael's got a bunch of closings and situations with his team he needs to deal with. I'm texting my team as well. Get in here, soak it up, set your alarm so you can know when we're when we're live. Also, if you're on YouTube right now, make sure you turn on the notifications where it says subscribe. Click that little subscribe button and make the bell look like it has alarms going around it. Um, that way you'll know when we're live and you can get alerted because I actually have Michael Frankie's YouTube turned on for alerts and I use it with my team all the time. I, I My sales training for my team and how to have the conversation is the role play that Michael and I did um, for everybody. So if you guys have not watched that, that's a great starting point for all of you. That was a very long-winded introduction for today. I just wanted to say hello, but I wanted to hand the reins over to you, Michael, and just say thank you so much for coming on here and give you the floor and just kind of let us get started here. What's what's cooking? Who are you? Where are you? What are we doing? My name's Michael. I'm out of Kansas City. been doing this for, what, nine, ten years now. And... Um, six years ago started in the whole niche strategy strategy with pre foreclosures and um, we've been growing that ever since and had so much success with it that i was sharing it and people just wanted more and more and more and um, now here we are and people across the country that are helping sellers changing their life and changing their own life financially so that's why we're here so i would love to see some preguntas in the side chat Happy to get going and answer any questions that you guys have today. Thank you. Creighton just told me it's hard to hear you. So I'm going to turn the volume up on here. If you guys are on Instagram live right now, I stream from Instagram just so people can know we're live on YouTube, but come over to YouTube because we will throw, if you're on YouTube, um, we'll throw a link so you can come up on stage and ask us questions. But, and also just a side, side note, if you're not in our little group chat, we have on Instagram live, we ask questions and we'll go in there so we can figure out what you guys want to see. Um, and there was, I, I put a poll in there today. I was like, what should we be talking about? Because we come in here and just kind of go with what you guys need. And somebody wanted to see how a transaction went from start to finish. So we're going to open up with this. When we get more people on, we'll bring you guys up stage, uh, on stage to answer your questions. Before we do, though, I want to talk about one other thing that I saw that you did, Michael, which I think is incredible. I know that you're unlocking a bunch of really cool things um, just that works for you. So if you guys are not on YouTube, and I'm going to show you this. So you can go to my YouTube channel and do this and Michael Frankie's. When you go to YouTube and you go to Michael Frankie's YouTube, you'll see him right here. I'm going to click it. See how there's these little lines around the bell? That's what you want to do. So when you're regularly, let me unsubscribe. When you subscribe, it just says, yeah, I'm subscribed. But if you click on it again and click all, anytime Michael posts a video, I get alerted to it. The reason I'm bringing this up is where is that video? Michael, there it is. Battle with AI. So what was this before we get going? Because I think this is pretty cool. Hello. So... There are some pretty big advancements with AI in the last year, specifically in the last six months. Mm -hmm. There are now um, communication models 
to where you can have almost real life dialogue. There's still a little bit of latency, not, you know, direct feedback like a normal human would. But in this vi video, all I did was type in a scenario. So I said that the lady was 70 years old. Her husband had passed away. He was the breadwinner and she had gotten behind on her payments. She wasn't able to take care of the house. She's completely overwhelmed and doesn't trust investors. And it can create this bot. And it's a pretty realistic scenario. I mean, sometimes, like I, I went through a number of times and she actually hung up on me and quit the conversation. And it was a little bit unrealistic of how a human would behave. But for anyone that is scared to get out there and cold call, scared to door knock, scared to have these conversations, very shortly, there's going to be the ability to have conversations like this in practice and, you know, plug in any scenario that you want and kind of overcome some of those fears. So pretty cool technology. I think it's sweet. You, I'm excited for you to release it so we can practice with it. I want to bring this up for everybody on here. I do this every week, but there's never a bad time to read. You got to go into his stuff. I actually have my team watch this because they're like, how do we stop the foreclosure? I'm like, well, Michael's already paid for somebody to go clean this up and explain it. You guys want to know the process? It's right here. We're going to keep it really condensed and to the point today. Um, seller role plays from a while ago, but my favorite one is this one because I was super mean to Michael. Okay. And when you guys are practicing, find somebody like Michael. Or, wow, that's a great place to pause on my face. Um, when you find somebody like Michael or somebody you're working with, I even do this with my team. If you were afraid and you're door knocking, and I see Mark says that he's door knocking right now. If you look at Poppy Goose, which I know is Jerry, Jerry said, just door knocked a guy was sitting on his doorsteps and said he needed help. Guys, yeah. everybody that's in this little community we have right here, they're getting deals because they're not afraid to take imperfect action and go out. And this is why we do this every Thursday. We want to help you help more homeowners. And this is the whole message. So with this, find somebody. I wanted to see how Michael overcame really tough sellers and objections because I don't like getting yelled at. Does anybody in here like getting yelled at? I don't want to be yelled at. And Michael did such a great job. I'm a very aggressive seller in the beginning of this role play. And you get to see how he diffuses the situation and leads with value. So if you guys have not watched this, you're going to hear me talk about it every week. It's imperative. I have my team watch it all the time. Check it out. Um, and Michael's YouTube just is constantly uploading stuff. Actually, Michael, because of you, you didn't know this, but you peer pressure bullied me into hiring somebody. Um, so I'm meeting with my guy later today so I can get my videos cleaned up so you guys can see them. But hang around people that are doing better than you and learn from them. That's the whole message I want to say. And I know there's on my Instagram, I, I posted for everybody on here. For anybody who does not know, Michael used to be a teacher. He was making $40,000 a year and now he's a millionaire. So I, I add my little tagline so you guys see it and you'll pay attention, but follow his roadmap. You guys can be successful from this. I know Jerry posted, I think we shared it last week, his check from door knocking. You guys can do this, just lead with value. Um, and I wanted to just bring it up. So if you guys did not know, Share this with somebody, turn on the notifications. We're here every Thursday and we'll answer your questions. Now, from start to finish, I got my iPad charged. I'm ready to roll. I'm going to make sure that I have it going for us so we can kind of go through this because I'm a visual person. Michael, before you get started, because somebody wanted to know how a transaction flows, mm -hmm. um, what, what would you say you need to be successful in this business? Like, all right, I'm going to go into real estate. What is the first most important thing that you need to be able to help homeowners? The most important thing to start attracting deals to yourself is more than likely belief that you can do something. When I started in this business, I, I didn't know squat and I, I really didn't believe that I was capable of doing deals. So how many deals do you think came my way at that point? Not very many. Mm -hmm. Every now and then I stumbled into one, but guys, you don't just scale to, you know, 10 deals a month, 15 deals a month, 50 deals a month. You become the person that attracts that many types of deals by growing yourself over time. So can you grow yourself from zero to a hundred deals overnight? Of course not. It's going to be a progression, but one of the biggest things that changed in my investing career was having some sort of morning routine. Some people might hate that. Maybe you want to do it at night. Maybe you want to do it on your lunch break. It doesn't really matter when you do it, but 
getting up, feeding yourself with whatever's important to you. I read the Bible. I read some sort of book that I'm, I'm wanting to get into. Um, I go over goals and stuff. I make sure I exercise. I'm primed for the day. Okay. This does not need to be long. You don't have to take three or four hours to do this. It could be 30 minutes. It could be 15 minutes, whatever you have time for. But to me, really starting to um, get your beliefs right in your brain that I am a deal magnet. I will do deals. I am someone that solves problems. Um, I know what to do. You know, these are the foundational beliefs that you must have to attract deals. So that being said, I don't want you to spend all day <laughs> doing this stuff and, and not taking action. Okay? But if you don't believe that you're valuable, if you don't believe that you're going to solve someone's problem, you're not ever going to take action. You're not going to ever get a deal. So this is something that you really need to um, put into, into effect. I, I used, um, I think it was called The Miracle Morning. Mm -hmm. was the first book that kind of set that off in my brain a long, long time ago. I think it's How Elrod. Right here in How my... Elrod, yeah. Yep. You got the book? Yep. It's right. Can you see it? There it is. There it is. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Therefore, it's important. <laughs> Love that book. It's a great book to get started with. And I, I did that. And, you know, I used to tell people, go through, do that challenge for a hundred days and message me and I'll do a one-on-one -on -one with you. But I realized people were just so focused on doing the book and they weren't actually doing the action items. So one thing I'm going to add on to this, make sure you're getting your mind right. Spend the 15 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the morning that you need. And then make sure you're doing things that are going to push the needle towards money-making activities. I, I hear you in my, 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 my mind so many times, Michael. I remember three months ago when we were helping Kaylee and Monica and it was like, Great, you're helping people stop foreclosures, but don't forget you got to pay your bills. So everybody on here help people, but when there is no other option, remember you're buying these houses to give them a fresh new start. So don't forget to do those money making activities. I would say get your mind right and then write your tasks down that are going to be those needle moving objectives tasks that will help you complete that. Um, yeah. So then so. number two. Real estate's awesome because there's 800 ways to make money, but real estate's also awful because there's 800 ways to make money. So the next trap people get in is seeing, oh, today I'm going to do foreclosures. Tomorrow I'm going to do sub two. The next day I'm going to do storage units. The next day I'm going to do multifamily. So number two, you really have to gain clarity over what you want and what niche you're going to go into. All of them work. There's not one that's right. There's not one that's wrong. It's just what does your heart guide you to do? And really focus on that thing. That doesn't mean you're you're trapped in that spot for forever. But once you sit, I, or, uh, systemize that process, you really understand it. Perhaps you can delegate and do something else. But the problem becomes when, hey, I'm going to start with pre-foreclosures. Oh, that didn't work in two days. Then I bounce over to something else and something mm -hmm. else. And then you never get good at anything. And then you just decide the real estate is not for you. But the reality is you didn't develop the skills to attract the deals to you. So gain clarity over what you want. My clarity came in 2018 when I knocked that first pre-foreclosure door and I had no leads, no deals. And all of a sudden I had a deal out of thin air that I signed for 50 grand. And that was just a light bulb. It's like, wow, I generated something out of, out of thin air. That lead was free. I really helped that seller. I made a lot of money. This is sick. <laughs> I, I love doing this. And that was my light bulb moment. So you've kind of got to really take the time to think. Um, a really good book for thinking is... I think it's called The Road Less Stupid. Hmm. I think it might be, it's either, it's it might be Alan Cunningham. I can't remember what the, what the author's uh, name was, but this book basically gives you a, a bunch of different topics and things about your life and your business that you really think through a topic for 45, 60 minutes. Um, this book's been great for me. I go back to it all of the time, but Gaining clarity on what you want, what aspect of real estate you're going to do, 
you have to to have that. I don't know if you you've had a moment, Caroline, where it was really a moment that helped you gain clarity. I mean, ongoing. Talk, I was I was honestly I'd say talk really I'd actually I think our one year anniversary of doing uh, the podcast where I had you come onto my podcast. Thank you. Somebody said they couldn't hear, so um, Alex can hear everybody. Um, you came on and just kind of talked about because I've seen you. I've met you before. You were nice and polite. You are a very, you are one of the most humble people I know. But once I heard your story and you told me how many families that you're helping and how much money you're making by helping them, I was like, oh, wait a second. What? This guy's getting really clear on what he wants to do and he focused on one thing at a time. That was really good. I'd actually say Rich Dad, Poor Dad, reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, because he talks about if, if I uh, change my view here, I am. Um, I just finished the Zoom. I'm going to stop this view and I'm going to show you a different one. I go over this with newer students and I show them my, uh, here it is right here. This little thing. So I talk about like, what is your most valuable resource that you have? And people are like, my family, my energy, my knowledge, the internet. And I'm like, it's attention. Our most valuable resource we have is our attention. And where our attention, our attention goes, if we're multitasking, we're not going to be fully into something. So then if you break it down from what Robert Kiyosaki said, it's really our focus. Our focus is the main thing that we need to be aware of. Where focus goes, energy flows. And when you think about that focus again, it's follow one course until successful. Just like what we just said, gain clarity over what you want. And after talking to you on the podcast where you came on and I just did what you did, I found homeowners directly from the county. I skip trace their phone numbers. I text them and I door knock them and I led with value asking if they wanted help. I got a property under contract in two weeks and I was like, oh gosh, darn it. This freaking guy is right. I can help more people from this. So from reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad and then talking to you and seeing other people um, be successful just from following one course, that really brought clarity to me. And then I realized, let me niche down. And let me go after the pre foreclosures so I can get into more homeowners that have problem points I can help with. So that was the book for me. Love it. So one was really developing yourself Two, and that's an ongoing thing. Get your beliefs mm -hmm. right. That is never ending. We will shed off, you know, different limiting beliefs. But even me doing 150 plus deals a year, I still have limiting beliefs. Caroline has limiting beliefs. So that's a never ending. Mm -hmm process. So don't think that, you know, once you get to a certain point, you just stop growing as a person. That's not how it works. Two, gain clarity over what you want. So let's just say that we, we go down the niche list path. Um, three, you really want to educate yourself at that point. Now, I am not the person that advocates being, I call it a content warrior, to where all you do is watch content and stuff. But there is a point where you really need to binge it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. This could be a matter of a couple of days or less. This isn't something that, that goes on for weeks or months, but choose someone that you really trust. It doesn't have to be me or Caroline. It can be anyone of your choice on YouTube. There's so much information. There's different courses out there. Educate yourself into really immersing yourself into the culture of that thing you want to do. Okay. What questions do we have so far? I know this is fairly simple, but all this stuff is important. Um, I saw a question over here. It's kind of off topic, but um, Brad said this on Facebook. Hey, Michael, did you have a buyer lined up prior to making your first deal? Heck They're a new student no. and they <laughs> want to go direct to seller. Heck no. So, so I'm putting all these, these things in place. That being said, when I was at my lowest point, I was not getting my beliefs right. I was not gaining clarity over what I wanted to do. I did not educate myself. I just went directly into it. And there's value in that too. But I'm just saying these are the things that have enabled me to get from maybe one deal a month or one deal a quarter to 15 deals a month. Okay, but you do not necessarily have to do these things. It's a roadmap. It's, the, it's not the only way to get somewhere. So let's transition here because I think they're more so getting into the nitty gritty. Let's mm -hmm. transition over to what it looks like when we're finding deals and what the transaction process is. And then we'll do bring everybody up on stage and we'll answer your questions. I want to.
try and keep this on topic. So we have one uh, YouTube video online that goes over what our topic list is. So Michael, you, you got really immersed. You educated yourself on how to help homeowners in pre-foreclosure, what the process looks like to stop the foreclosure or um, help them reinstate it, get a loan mod, all of the things we've covered in different videos before. So one, would you say for the transaction process, would the first step be now find the data? What would, where would you start? Okay. So we've, we've primed our mind. We've educated ourselves. Now it's time to start taking action. Mm -hmm. First thing you're going to do, the first question I always get, well, where are the leads? Where do I get the data at? So that's definitely going to be number four here is to establish whatever data sources you have, either get that information yourself and start developing systems around that or fully automate it and delegate it to someone else, which is what I would prefer for you. But there is a lot of value in going in, really digging into your area, understanding the systems that are there, the websites that are there, and developing those systems for someone else to take over for you. Okay, That is a $10 an hour task, but you do have to do the work to find that information um, to use. That being said, I will have an automated way for you in a very short amount of time. <laughs> but um, that that was really valuable for me to go in and find all these sources in my county and know exactly where information is, really dive into that. There's something that un unlocks in your mind there. And then you start establishing patterns like, oh, this is where pre-foreclosures is. I'm guessing I know where probate is. I'm guessing I can figure out where other lists are. Okay. So establishing the data sources, once you have that, the next step is probably establishing some sort of KPI or standard of which you are going to operate. Some good questions over here in the, in the side chat. We need to not be too long winded so we can get to them. <laughs> All right. Okay. We'll, we'll run through this and we'll get to the questions because these are good questions. Well, let's go to this one really quickly. Gabriella said, how did you educate yourself on different scenarios, situation, asking others, asking attorneys, besides watching videos, as you had mentioned? I mean, I'm, I'm going to kind of take this for a second. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot more by doing the action and being in the process of it. So if I were you, Gabriella, I'd say, get all of this first. And once you're ready to cross that bridge, then go look for those answers even further. We have tens and tens, because we're almost at the hundreds of videos of where we have gone through pulling this, having the conversation. Go find somebody who needs the help. Once they say they want help, then come back and ask us about it. Message us on Instagram, we'll reply to you. But I ask a lot of questions in the process and I learned by paying an attorney for that lesson. What would you say to this, uh, Michael? What was that again? I'm sorry. I was reading some of these questions. Oh, no, you're good. Um, how would you educate yourself on the different scenarios? I said by taking action, what would you do? Guys, I learned about every scenario from experiencing the scenario and then finding a solution. And then over time, it's like, oh, I know how to do that. That's the only way that you're going to experience these things. There's no way to simulate that. Although maybe the AI thing will be able to do it soon. <laughs> but um, no, the, the first deal I ever did the seller needed to go to assisted living. They had dementia. Do you think I knew anything about assisted living and dementia and how that worked? Heck no. But I typed in, you know, how to help sellers with dementia and it brought up caseworkers and social workers. I called up a social worker and I said, look, I'm trying to buy this house. I really don't know how to handle this situation because one of the sellers has dementia. I don't feel right about that. I had the seller or the uh, the caseworker come out, evaluated him, and said that the husband was good to make a decision. Signed with him, um, she helped me find them a place to go, and that's a, a resource that I still use today. So that was the very first deal that I experienced. I experienced something I didn't understand, and then I had a skill. I had a contact, and that's how you start, you know, stacking skills over time. You just see hundreds of these scenarios and then you start you know understanding what the solution is for all of them i like that that's a good one good answer okay so what would you say we established the kpis with six 
What's that? What would number, what would step six be? Now that we've okay, established, you've established your KPIs, then you want to have some sort of action plan. So whether that be you're going out and door knocking in the morning and cold calling in the afternoon or vice versa or whatever your KPIs entail, maybe you're just wanting to send emails. Maybe you don't want to do anything else. Establish whatever your action plan is. It doesn't matter if you're full time. It doesn't matter if you're a W-2 worker and you only have a couple hours. It doesn't matter if you only have Saturday mornings. Establish whatever your action plan is. And then number seven is execute on that action plan. Hey, you're going to go out there. You're going to experience things. You're going to have conversations. You're going to be nervous. You're going to have no idea what is going on. And that's why it's valuable to have a community like, like we have here. Because then after you execute on the action plan, you're going to generate opportunity after a time. And then number eight would be, be bring your problems back to the community and have us help you. And if you rinse and repeat these eight steps, and we could probably add some more, but I think this is a, a pretty solid list to start with. If you rinse and repeat these eight steps, you, you can be a millionaire yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really that simple. I like that. So this is a great starting point for you. Now I'm going to ask you one other question, Michael. We're going to change the view here. Yep. Okay. Let's do it as a timeline. All right. So say we find a homeowner who's in pre-foreclosure and we go, we, so we find them. Find home owner. And they agree they want help and we put them under contract. Okay. Now we put them under contract to this is this part over here is closed slash funded. There's a D on the end of that. Okay, closed to funded, but they're in pre foreclosure. What's our next step after we put them under contract? So the first thing, do we have a TC or no? We're solo. We're brand new. We oh. don't have a TC. So you obviously need a very strong title company partner. Okay. Okay. So let's. Before we even move on to that, let's make sure we have all the, the documents that, that we need okay. to send over to title. So a lot of you think, oh, I have a purchase agreement. That's enough. Okay. When you have someone that is behind on their payments, they have a mortgage in place. Yes. Mm -hmm. You need to have all that mortgage information and permission for your title company to order that payoff. So there's going to be a purchase agreement or maybe your sub two agreement, whatever it is. And then you're going to have some type of third party authorization form. This form is provided to you by your title company. So that should be enough to get you started. The second you have that information, you need to get that information over to your title company. And if you don't have a title company, we can go into potentially how to find one. But okay. are we assuming that they have a title? Well, let's just assume that they have a title company for now, just for our, our time here. So once we get all of this data, we need to send it over to our title company. Yeah. So the way I like to do it is send over an email, attach the, the seller on that email and just say, you know, some sort of alarming uh, description for the email, like foreclosure sale in three days, whatever, whatever it is. In that email, just explain to the title company exactly what the situation is, when the foreclosure sale is, here's my purchase agreement, here's my authorization form, um, here's a picture of the mortgage statement with the loan number, here's all the information about this, this transaction that you would need to know. So you want to give them everything. Do not make them fight you for information down the line. Provide them the seller's email, provide them the seller's phone number. Don't be one of those people that just gives half bud information. Okay. Because mm -hmm. we're dealing with a, a pretty tight timeline a lot of times. And you want to make the escrow officer's job really, really easy. Gotcha. So. Okay. So we get all this over to title. We send it over there. We also, you know, CC homeowner. Mm -hmm. um, what's our next step now that we get this over to title? Okay. Now you want to go ahead and 
you know, let the homeowner know that's that's happened. You know, sometimes these folks, as we've found, are not the best with communication. So although you've CC'd them on that email, they, they may not see that. So you just want to let them know that you've done that, give them reassurance. My, uh, my transaction coordinator actually sends an introductory email that kind of introduces all the players that might be involved. So that mm -hmm. could be something that's even before open escrow, but okay. uh, we don't need to worry about that. Now, for me, my, my title company actually does almost all the heavy lifting after that in terms of stopping a foreclosure sale. But I assume right now we're wanting to go through the anyone in this chat doing it themselves. Is that what you're wanting, Caroline? Yeah, let's do it. Everybody's doing it themselves right now. Okay. So next step. You're going to want to get a verbal authorization for yourself to speak to the lender. So how that works is you're going to get the seller on, on the phone. You're going to third party patch in the lender. You're going to go through all the information that they require to, to get someone on the phone. And the lender is going to say, well, you're not on, on, the, on the loan. I need permission from the seller. The seller will give you verbal authorization right there. Now you could do some sort of third party authorization and fax that in to the lender, but that takes multiple days to accomplish sometimes. This is immediate with verbal. Mm -hmm. okay? So you can get in there, um, get authorization. Then the lender is free to speak to you about anything and everything you want. We're going through a lot. Do we have any questions here? Yeah, I, I, don't know, so, I don't know the experience level in the chat. So Marlena just said, this is so good. Thank you. Um, there's some questions that are off topic. We'll come back to you once we're done. So I'm going to ask you this. When you get the verbal with the lender, is that so you have access for the entire time for the rest of this escrow that you're talking to the lender? Or is this only for that one phone call? It's a really important question to ask the lender. Sometimes they'll give you like a 24 hour access. Sometimes it'll be for the life of the loan. Sometimes it'll be for 30 days. So it's definitely a good question to ask. That way you don't have to bother the seller because it's hard enough to get them under contract and then get them on this phone call. You don't want to keep plaguing them. So cover your bases on that call. Ask how long this is going to be for and, and make a note of that. Okay. So... Okay. Find the homeowner, get the property under contract, open up escrow, update the homeowner that we are opening up escrow, get the verbal from the lender that you can speak to them so we can get all the documents we need. Then what? Okay. Now you're going to explain to the lender, we'll call him Wells Fargo this time. You're going to explain to Wells Fargo, hey, look, the seller's in foreclosure. Here's the auction date. I have this house under contract to buy. I want to pay off this note before um the auction date what is it that you guys need from me to either get a postponement or to either get a payoff or a reinstatement okay sometimes you might get someone that is super knowledgeable they've been at wells fargo for 20 years they know every single aspect of everything sometimes you're going to get a complete noob Someone that knows absolutely nothing. They're worthless. They don't care about people. All they know how to do is go uh, through the Wells Fargo handbook and say exactly what they're supposed to say. If you get the, the person that's really knowledgeable, wonderful. They will guide through, you through exactly what to do, exactly what documents are needed, what to say. If you get someone that's worthless, <clears throat> and there will be people that are worthless, Kindly get yourself off the phone, get back on the phone, and you have to realize that there's there's a sales floor at most of these places. So there might be 20, 30, 100 people on the sales floor. So you want to keep calling back until you find someone that is is worth talking to. And even if you don't have any experience in this industry, you know someone that knows who's what they're talking about and someone that doesn't. It's pretty intuitive. Okay. So let's say you've, a, you've asked, you've found someone that's really good. We've asked the lender what they need. 
Generally, these are the documents you're going to need. Okay? You're going to need your purchase agreement. You're going to need a proof of funds. You're going to need some sort of cover letter. And if possible, to work this out with your, your title company, a bare bones HUD statement. This doesn't have to have any of the, the, um, the payoff information, anything like that. It can basically just have your purchase price and their estimated title fees and stuff on there. But if you're able to sub give that to the, or the uh, lender, they're going to say, oh, this person's really, they're on the ball. Okay, so again, purchase agreement, HUD statement, cover letter, proof of funds. And you're going to ask them where to send that information. More than likely, they're going to give you some sort of email or a fax number. Yes, they still use fax. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's 2024. Okay, so we send that over to them. So now we're going to send all the documents they need. Mm -hmm. Send docs. Then what's next? Marcus Foster and, and Jacob say, what would the cover letter say? <clears throat> so basically, this is the opportunity to lay it on thick of the situation. Say, you know, hey, Wells Fargo. My name is Michael Frankie. I've been buying houses for a long time. I'm coming alongside um, Ann Smith, um, and I am buying the property. She has gone through so much in the last few years. Her husband passed away. She's going through cancer. She just needs a little bit of help in postponing the sale or allowing us to uh, have time to close. It would mean so much to her and allow her life to go in a different trajectory if you would just work with us and give us some time. Yada yada. This is my op this is your opportunity to really try to tug at the heartstrings of the lender, of the foreclosure attorney. If you've ever had someone submit an offer on the MLS and they'll send like some personal handwritten letter with a picture of their cute dog and. They're like, we want to have this house for our dog or whatever. It's sort of like that to where you tug on their heartstrings a little bit. You don't have to do that. I've just found that it's effective. All right. So now I know after this, because I'm not seeing any of those questions you just had. We got to get you synced up with my stream yard because I do not have the questions you just brought up. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm not seeing anything that you're seeing, I guess. Okay. Um, okay. So we got those. I hope that's helpful for your uh, um cover letter for everybody. So once we get those, they either approve the postponement or they don't. Let's just go with most of the time. I mean, you're getting things stopped typically. So would you say the next so, step is? So typically they'll say, well, we will escalate this file. We will send it to the powers that be. Then, then you have to call back in over and over and over, sometimes three, five, 10 times. Okay? You have to be very pushy with this there are going to be people that tell you, no, we can't get it done. And basically you just have to tell them that that's, that's not an option. I don't accept that at all. Get that off the, get off the phone with that person, call someone back. Once you find that contact, that's good. You can ask for their extension number. That way you can go directly back to them. Okay. But, um, this is, this is something where you have to be relentless. That's one of my core values as a company. Absolutely relentless. I, I will not accept no for an answer. Um, fortunately, now I have a bulldog and a title guy that does this for me. And you should look into that for yourself. Because getting these sales stopped is not a small amount of time. If you want to scale your operation, you can't sit on the phone all day and, and be doing this. But I want to lay this out for people that are new. You really need to understand Kind of the process of it. Okay. So okay. what's next, Michael? So generally after that, you're just following up. If you provide all this information in a reasonable amount of time, you know, three, four, five business days plus, I would say 80 to 90% of the time, you can get the thing stopped. Okay. Generally, they're going to give you 
an extra seven days, maybe an extra 30 once there's a postponement. And then that should allow you plenty of time to execute on, on purchasing the house with your title company. That's what happened with me yesterday, guys. I just for everybody, I was uh, on the phone. Well, actually, I got an update from my team and they said title said, hopefully we'll hear back from the lender today if the auction gets stopped, which was today. The auction was today. And I was like, oh, no, hopefully we'll hear by the end of the day. So I called the lender myself. I did not have authorization to speak. Our homeowner was at work. It's a single mom with three kids. I And this is I'm going to go into Jimmy Dean's question. Is there a way to talk to ask to speak to a supervisor? That's actually what I did. So I was on the phone with them and I, I went into loss mitigation and she's like, well, we need to have somebody who's authorized to speak. And I was like, well, our title company already has a third party authorization. Let's go. They had sent the third party authorization over to the trustee. The trustee had not gotten it to, gotten it to the lender yet. So I had to sit on the phone with them. In that time of me being on hold with them, I brought my title uh, escrow officer on the phone. We were on hold. I asked to speak to the manager. In that time, I was just catching up with my, my escrow officer about some other deals that we have. And they, she got an email from the trustee saying that they postponed the auction. So from calling the lender, that sped everything up because the lower level person, their, um, let me just stop this, their supervisor contacted the trustee, I'm assuming, and sped up the process and got the auction stopped. So absolutely, you can ask to speak to a supervisor. I did, basically did what Michael just said on my cover letter. I was really kind. I was like, hi, my name's Caroline. I'm the buyer on this deal. We've already presented, we've already uh, given away proof of funds, everything else that we need. I'm just waiting to hear back at the auctions tomorrow. We have a single mother with three children, no family in the area. We're trying to prevent her from having a foreclosure and having to file bankruptcy. How can you help us out? And, you know, the lower person's like, I, ugh, my hands are tied. Can you push me up to a manager? And we waited. And that's how we got to stop. So absolutely kill them with kindness too. Same thing I brought up why I shared Michael's um, YouTube page. I do that when I'm speaking to uh, title officer or escrow officers when I'm speaking to lenders, just be polite to people and have your story and that will help you out a ton. So I hope that helped everybody uh, really quickly. I want to make sure we got that. And then we had time to invite you guys on stage and answer your questions. So Michael, I'm going to give you the link so you can throw it on there. You might have to watch how you copy and paste it. We got to, after this, let's make sure we get your stream yard set up with mine. Just okay. copy it when you paste it. Everybody who's on your YouTube channel should be able to come backstage. So if you guys are on YouTube only, we can bring you up. You'll see a link right there and uh, you can click that. You can come backstage and ask us some questions. But while we're waiting for you guys to come back and in, into the backstage to come upstage, I'll answer, I'll bring up the questions for Michael. We'll go through and answer them for you guys. Um, I had a few earlier ones uh, from your YouTube channel. So Quincy said, Michael, do you set a follow-up for a follow-up knock for people who say they have it taken care of? I've been focused on people who want to talk to me. Just want to make sure I'm not missing someone. So just because someone says they have it taken care of at the door, that, that means nothing to me. I, I completely disregard that. That's just a defense mechanism. So you got to have some sort of line or something you're committed to saying. Kind of a general framework that I would say is, hey, I'm glad you have it taken care of, but Wells Fargo, sometimes they don't know their left hand from their right and they drop the ball on things just so I can clear this from my head, make sure you're okay. And then I'll buzz off. Do you mind just sharing with me what, what they did? Maybe it'll help me help someone else. Something like that. They'll either say, well, I have it taken care of. In that situation, if they say something unintelligent, more than likely they do not have it taken care of. If they say, well, I got a hold of loss mitigation and I filled out some loan modification paperwork. I sent that in they temporarily or they provisionally approved me and they've canceled the sale to allow me time to get my loan modification processed. Well, that sounds like they've actually put some time and effort into it. And no matter what, you're trying to get a micro commitment. So whether it be the person that says something intelligent, hey, great, it sounds like you've got it taken care of. Um, just in case something happens and you need a backup plan, can I get your phone number? I promise I'm not going to spam you to death. Hey, I'm just going to check in with you a few days before the sale. Make sure that loan mod got taken care of. Uh, hopefully we don't need to talk again. Okay. And try to get a phone number or something. Guys, if you're not willing to pierce through that initial resistance, you're not going to get many deals. You could say that about anything in sales. 
if you're not willing to go through an objection, it's going to be tough. I would agree. Um, basically just off of what Michael said, I've done the same thing, but I, even if they say like, I've gotten it handled and they say they have it figured out, they're working through that. Great. I'm glad you do have it handled. I'm going to just touch base with you next week and make sure it's been updated. Cause I don't want, you know, I don't want you to have the foreclosure. So even though sometimes, I say that, sometimes you can straight up bring up the website. Like it'll be two days before the sale. Oh, I got taken care of. And I'm like, I'm glad you do, but just for my peace of mind, uh, this attorney says it's not. I, I'm just going to show you the website just so you can see it. Oh, it's not canceled yet? What, what's going on? And then then you might have an opportunity to talk about it. Okay. So when you have an opportunity at the door, there's a very slim margin between no deal and deal. If you have that opportunity, you got to take it. Don't, don't chicken out at that point. Mm-hmm. Game changer right there. I love, that's a huge pointer for you guys. Um, Mark Barrett said, I want to start tracking KPIs. What KPIs are you guys tracking? And what are the numbers you want to hit to be successful doing what you guys are doing? Thanks in advance. Love you both. Um, we've covered this a lot. <laughs> I will share my screen really quickly. But I've done this like almost every week, I feel like. Let me find my KPIs. I just copied off of Michael. Shooting for 15 doors a day, 100 doors a week. Um and I, I even give like the reason why these are my team's KPIs. So just so you guys can see them, the key performance indicators, being in love with the process, knowing it's a marathon. And then the KPIs they're trying to hit are right here. 50 calls a day, 15 conversations. Those can be new ones. Those can be follow-ups. 15 doors knocked a day, five appointments a day, one contract a day. Do I expect new people to hit one contract a day? No, you need to start building that pipeline up. But this is what their goal is for the week. So I hope that answers your question. We've covered that a lot on here, so I won't go too deep into that right now. But that was a good question, Mark. Our, our KPIs don't have to be yours. Mm -hmm. okay? So you got to choose what you can mentally hold yourself to. Maybe that's 10 doors a week. That's okay. Yeah. If it takes 100 doors to get a deal, well, within 10 weeks, you theoretically could get a deal. And if you can hold yourself to that and be consistent, get a deal, you know, a cup one or two times a quarter, that can be life-changing money. So don't feel like you have to hit a hundred doors a week to, to be successful. Whatever you guys can do consistently. I think that's the biggest thing you don't want to do. Like, you know what? I'm only going to door knock on Sundays and I'm going to try and just wear myself out. Just do the consistent things because they're going to pay off. I don't actually, Eddie came on my zoom and told me this. He, um, he got an, he's getting another house under contract today. He went over there nine. I know, right? He's now he's got the pipeline full. He's gone to that house nine times and put sticky notes on it. Never been able to find a phone number that works. The heir of the homeowner, the property, texted him yesterday. And now they're going over today to go walk the property and figure out what they can put it under contract for. Yeah. But he kept going by and they were taking his sticky notes off. So just be consistent, especially with those houses that need the work or need the help, or you think you're going to go to the abyss. Those are the ones you really want to zero in on. This is not a question. This is just what Nina said. I have an appointment in 20 minutes to help a homeowner who is in foreclosure and I'm planning to do a short sale. Thank right. you for all that you do. So I thought that was pretty good. Um, okay. <laughs> Luis said, what do you do when a homeowner is threatening to call the cops on you? Guys, when uh, whenever that happens, more than likely several people have been by their house that day and that's just the final straw. If they're threatening to call the cops, nothing's going to happen at that time. Okay. You may as well just politely leave. I probably wouldn't even try to get a micro commitment. That person is done mentally right then. Does that mean you mark them off the list? Heck no. <laughs> so would I go back to the house? Probably not. Maybe, maybe with some time passed, maybe. There have been times where people yelled at and screamed at me, which is rare. But then I'll come back some other time and they almost don't even know who I am. Because guys, they, they just see angry. It's like a bull seeing red when they get in that, ma that mode. But that doesn't mean you can't shoot them a text, shoot them an email, shoot them a Facebook message, something that's a little bit less threatening. When you're on their property, are you trying to threaten them? No, but they may feel threatened. So come at it in a way to where it's very conversational, easy. You're just talking online perhaps build up a relationship with them. And then maybe you can meet at the house again. But yeah, if, they, if they're in that mode, 
I, I wouldn't pursue it anymore that day. It's not worth your safety. Also, if you guys were not attorneys, but if you ever do not feel safe, do not go to a house. I've gone situations where I'm not going to go up there. It doesn't make me don't feel great. So don't do anything that's going to make you uncomfortable. Um, Lonnie said, skip trace leads, then go door knock or go knock on doors. Yeah, I'm going to call them first as my goal, uh, especially if it's really far from me. I'm going to try and call them and then I'm going to go door knock. But Michael, you door knock, call, you do all of it in the same day. I've always been a door knock first, then cold call guy, but either way is effective. Yeah. Lonnie also said, many of my appointments, um, I have the homeowners want to keep the house. And I've not been able to close a deal yet. However, I've only been on six appointments. Okay. It's frequency, baby. You got to just keep following up. Everybody wants to keep their house. I also want a unicorn. Some things don't work out. Sometimes Lonnie, these homeowners- Lonnie, you should go listen to some of Caroline and I's role plays. In those role plays, she's adamant that she's keeping the house. Throughout the role play, I help her understand why that perhaps isn't a good idea. Okay, when We had to be careful of towing the line of being super nice and just helping people save their house. That is our goal. But at the same time, Lonnie, you got to feed your family. So you're guiding through people through all their options. You're supporting them and going with other options that don't benefit you financially. But don't get me wrong. You're, you're trying to get them to the cash or the sub two, two uh, ending there. So you may be being too nice. Go back through some of my calls. Go back through some of Caroline's calls. Listen to the way we go through the options and watch how someone's uh, opinion of what needs to be done can change in just a few minutes. Ditto. I would say the exact same thing he just said. Um, Bryce Saunders said, do you have any formula to check equity? I've been getting a good amount of appointments, but when I arrive, they owe too much for us to give them anything. Yeah. We use, um, a few different sources. Uh, IDI is a, a data uh, aggregator. Um, we've used PropStream. We've used a few in the past. A lot of the times, depending on the state, the, the equity can be pretty, pretty solid. Um, you don't necessarily know what the arrears are, what the fees might be. But that's one thing we track on, on our data is how much equity is there in the house. Am I real excited to go to a house that has $5,000 in equity? Not really. I mean, you could get a sub two deal out of it, which is great. Put that thing in the portfolio if that's where you are in your career. But if something has $100,000 in equity, $250,000 in equity, is that going to get my attention more? Yep. But that's just something when we're we're aggregating our data, we're paying attention to that. We're putting that on our spreadsheet or whatever piece of paper that you use. And that's how partially how our, our acquisition guys determine what they're going to do. It's like, am I going to spend my time at a high equity situation or a low equity situation? High equity. So the answer, guys. Um, we still try and help everybody if possible. Talk Absolutely. To them the resources they need. And also don't necessarily trust those sites with their equity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll be like, oh, there's negative $40,000 in equity. It's a reverse mortgage. There was, uh, there was a, I got my, my heart going here. <laughs> I had a deal in Warrensburg, Missouri a while back. It, the equity was negative $40,000 on prop stream. My guy says, should I go out there? It has negative $40,000 in equity. And I'm like, yeah, you go out there anyway. We didn't go out there. Well, the house ended up being worth $300,000 and the lady owed like 90. And one of, one of the guys that learned from me and has his own business locked it up for like 120. He wholesaled it for like 175. And I just wanted to wring my guy's neck because he didn't go out there and take the shot. So of course, some of that data is going to be valuable in helping you assess what to do. But just because a site says this is what the equity is, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Trust but verify. And no platform's perfect. Yeah, no platform's perfect. Never assume it is. This isn't a question, but I saw it earlier and I didn't read it off. This is gold for us newbies. I watch tons of content and my favorite of the week is always this live. Thank you so much, Michael and Caroline. So you're welcome, John. Thanks for throwing that in there. Um, okay. Let's see if this is a question. Alexander said, I'm working virtual with cold calling foreclosures. Do you have VA callers calling these lists and make the first outreach and then your team make it from there? 
Would you suggest leveraging callers? I do not have VAs doing it for me. I have Americans doing it that are on my um, team, but because it's a sensitive conversation, I think people have VAs calling and it, the market has changed. I started doing this in uh, June of 2020. So now we're in April of 2024. I'm coming up on four years of doing this. Everybody is was using VAs and they're so used to, I've had so many homeowners that have contacted, like, I don't want to, you're not even American. I don't want to work with you. You're trying to steal my house. Like find, find what works for you, but I don't do that. Michael, do you have virtual well, assistants that do your outreach? I've never had good luck with VAs setting appointments. What I did have decent luck with, and we did this for a while, I would actually have them cold call through the list and any of the phone numbers that were disconnected, they would delete any phone numbers that they found to be correct. They would mark it as correct. That way our acquisition people at least were being more efficient with their time. Um, but that's more of something once you have some disposable income and make things more efficient at first, you're not going to do something like that, but that was a nice little time save that we used to do. Yeah. Uh, John also said, uh, once the auction is stopped, do you have enough time to wholesale? Can you then assign the deal if you have some buyers lined up? How much time do you have? So every situation is different. Mm -hmm. Find a buyer first. So like the auction I stopped yesterday, I have until May 9th to get it paid off. So just so you guys are aware, yeah, I'll have a buyer lined up first. Always have your buyer prepared. That helps you out a ton. But Michael, you say anything different? Yeah, there's always time to wholesale, but you got to make sure your buyer's legit. Okay, make sure that their their lenders legit. Um, you should have the ability to take it down if necessary. So obviously, you'd love to wholesale, but obviously, be looking for uh, private money lenders. Have the ability to take care of these homeowners in case your your end buyer messes something up or the timeline is is screwed up for whatever reason. And speaking of private money lenders, I have so many people that are reaching out to me to lend on the deals that I have right now. Michael's bringing in stuff that you guys can lend on. P join with people that are actively doing deals where you guys can learn and ask questions. Michael, if you if you had a private money lender and they wanted to know where the deal came from or maybe walk the property, would you let them do that? Yeah. I mean, usually my, my private money lenders at the beginning, they're a little skeptical. They maybe haven't invested in something like this before. Those first few deals, they they want to see the property. They want to go through the pictures. They want to go through the the uh, promissory note, deed of trust with you, all of that type of thing. But I've noticed over time, once the deal goes well, they get their money back plus their profit. A few deals down the line, they're like, oh, yeah, here's the money. <laughs> it's just like a trust thing like anything else. And they should be. Honestly, guys should be skeptical. You guys should double check everything. Don't trust don't just blindly trust, trust, but verify, run your numbers. Like you have to make sure it's a good deal. This is just a word to the wise. Susan just said this. I had a guy that yelled and screamed at me the next week. He called and threatened the attorneys. Now he's in jail with an assault charge and no bail. His house went to auction. So yeah, if it's unsafe guys, do not go back. Please don't put yourself in compromising positions. Um, okay. Hector said, what next steps can we take for a property that was recently sold at auction? How do we track down the property, what this property sold for? And what can we do about the redemption rights? We're not really getting into that just yet. We're trying to figure that out so we can help you guys on to that. So we're not. Like, I mean, yeah, I'm pretty sure you messaged me about that property. If it's in Kansas, we can talk about it on the side. Kansas is the wild, wild west. I don't think this chat is ready for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Lonnie said, is there a free option to find the equity? I use Zillow numbers for equity. Is that okay to use? <laughs> and nothing's going to be 100% accurate. It's probably going to be best if you reach out to the homeowner, just go have the conversation. I'm not even going to let you do that. No, go have the conversation with the homeowner. We're not going to complicate it. Talk to them. You'll get it from the bird or the horse's mouth when you reach out to the lender and figure out what's necessary there. Um, okay. Michael, what can you do if the bank wants the wire in 24 to 48 hours before even the morning of the auction? I've lost a few deals that went to auction for this reason. So I think you probably put this down before Michael and I said, get private money lenders lined up. Would you say anything different here? So, Obviously, you're pushing for that postponement. A lot of the, the people in that call center, they go by their handbook, right? The Wells Fargo handbook. And they say, oh, it says here that you have to reinstate the loan 48 hours before the sale. And not the answer that I want to hear. I'm going to go to someone else, escalate it, call, call the, uh, the authority of that situation and get a different answer. Um, but if for whatever reason... 
You can't close on the property. They will not postpone. There's nothing else you can do. You've, you've gone down every avenue. That's when my least favorite option comes into play, the old, the old bankruptcy play. And it will stop the sale. So if there's significant equity in the house and the homeowner is completely on board with that, they understand the ramifications of what happens, and you refer them to a third party to help them with the bankruptcy, that is an option. Okay, but that should be a last ditch effort. Okay, that affects someone for a long time. So please don't just tell someone to file a bankruptcy so that you can make a buck. This impacts them for, for seven, eight, 10 years. Okay, They need to fully understand what they're getting themselves into before they do that. But very effective strategy to, to get the sale stopped. Uh, Michael, what's the difference between like getting a bankruptcy started and getting it dismissed and actually going all the way through a bankruptcy? So most of the time, if, if someone files bankruptcy and they, they want to stay in the house long term, you're going to have to go through the courts. They will establish a, a new payment plan, struck, restructure the deal, can reconsolidate debt. And it's going to be a long term plan for that person to enact. Now, you don't necessarily have to go all the way through the courts. You can just ask for it to be dismissed within a couple of weeks. I don't know the inner workings of how that works. My title company does all of it, and so will yours. Um, they'll request that a judge just dismiss it. Um, at that point, they don't have to worry about the plan on the bankruptcy, but they will have it on their record. So just because something is dismissed, that doesn't mean it's dismissed from their record. It'll be on there, um, but it allows them to move forward with selling the house. Okay. And then Susan just said, thank you. Well, guys, it's 102. We just completed an hour of this. We went through a lot today. We covered what the transaction flow kind of looks like, how to be successful. I want to just remind you guys of one thing here. Your mindset is everything. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And we sometimes, I don't know if you've ever, I like the movie, Perk, or the book, Perks of Being a Wallflower. We accept the love we think we deserve. We accept what we, we make as much money as we think we're capable of getting. So don't sell yourself short. Reach out to people. Go knock those doors. If Michael's door knocker would have just knocked that door, they could have made, what was it, a $50,000 assignment? $50,000 rip, man. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> Alex, like, it went so fast today. We were just jamming information at you guys. So what we want to see is more people coming back. Actually, I think we were supposed to have somebody come back this week and tell us how their door knocking went. We want you guys to come in here every Thursday and tell us about your wins. Ask questions. Bring your problems. That's what we're here to help you with. Um and then we have some surprises coming for you at the end of Q2, beginning of Q3. So don't forget, every Thursday at 12 o'clock Arizona time, we're on here. Please, again, if you guys are um, watching us, we don't get paid any money to be on this. We would really love it if you could like this video, share this video, come in, subscribe to our channels, and then interact with us. Message us on Instagram. We'll get back to you. We want you guys to start doing deals, helping more homeowners, and making a difference in your community and also making sure that you can make a difference in your family. So Michael, do you want to say anything else before you wrap this up? Oh, you summed it up. Good. Can't say it any better. Beautiful. We'll see you guys here next Thursday at 12 o'clock. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day, everybody.